This is the weird cult movie Iceberg. We can define a cult movie as a film that upon its release was not considered successful either at the box office or critically. But in the time since its release has managed to grow some sort of fan base or garner some level of like appreciation or discourse around it. And in some cases, like at the top of this iceberg, these movies went on to become huge successes, uh, genre defining classics. Like we have uh, Blade Runner up there, we have The Big Lebowski. This iceberg is by no means a completely exhaustive and, and comprehensive look at cult films. I'm sure I could make like 10 videos on this topic and I would still be barely scratching the surface. So with that in mind, this is just a small selection of films uh, and an interesting selection at that. I make videos just like this one, ideally every three to four weeks. So if this is content that you're into, consider subscribing so you don't miss any new uploads. And with all of that waffle out of the way, let's get into layer one of this iceberg, the cult classics. The Rocky Horror Picture Show was released in 1975 and is directed by Jim Sharman. It's based on the musical stage production of the same name from 1973, which was also directed by Jim Sharman, and it sees a lot of the original cast reprising their roles for the movie. Now, Rocky Horror is first and foremost a musical, but it also incorporates elements of horror and elements of sci-fi and elements of, of comedy, and it just results in this very specific and offbeat movie. Before like starting research for this iceberg, I had actually never seen this movie before. My closest reference point would have been that one scene in Perks of Being a Wallflower, but um, yeah, I enjoyed this movie like way more than I was expecting to. The story of this film centers around a young, newly engaged couple who are on the way to visit this friend of theirs who is sort of like an ex-teacher, but on the way there, their car gets a flat tire in the middle of the night, in the rain, with like no sign of civilization anywhere. However, there is this castle that is not too far away. So they decide to go there in the hopes of using the telephone so that they can contact somebody. When they get inside, they are surprised to find that they are greeted by a party that is going on. There are a bunch of people like in tuxedos and wearing sunglasses. And um, they soon meet the head of the house, Dr. Frankenfurter, who is actually a trans alien from out of space but he is also a mad scientist who, in his lab, creates Frankenstein-type creations. Except in this case, the Frankenstein-type monster is this blonde, very tan, very muscular uh, gentleman named Rocky. And from that point onwards, the movie is absolutely off the rails. Now, initially, this film was not a huge hit at the box office, and the reception was largely negative. But a year after its release, it would become a hit as a midnight movie, beginning at select theatres in New York. It became very common for audiences to participate along with the movie, and they would do this by dressing in costume, standing in front of the screen, and uh, miming and lip syncing along with the characters of the film. And as crazy as this sounds, this became a very popular thing to do. It didn't take long for this whole thing to catch on, and very quickly, the Rocky Horror Picture Show became a worldwide phenomenon. Today, the Rocky Horror Picture Show has grossed well over $200 million, meaning that it made back its budget many, many, many times over. And one thing that is like super unique about this movie is that it is still regularly screened theatrically, even today. And the whole shadow cast element of it is a tradition that is still carried out. So if you live in a major city, there's a really good chance that there's a movie theater near you that will be screening this movie sometime in the near future. The Big Lebowski was released in 1998 and is a movie by the legendary Coen brothers. Their previous film, Fargo, had been a massive success, both at the box office and critically, managing to grow $60 million against a $7 million budget. It also received seven Oscar nominations, winning Best Original Screenplay, and Frances McDormand would win Best Actress for her portrayal of Marge Gunderson. So that's where the Coens were at, and the expectations for their next film were very high. Enter. The Big Lebowski. As is usually the case with the Coen's films, The Big Lebowski is this hodgepodge of genre. There's crime movies, stoner movies, uh, there's this like detective noir thing going on, sports movies, I mean, not really, but there is a lot of bowling in this movie, so uh, the always iconic Jeff Bridges plays the lead role of Jeff Lebowski, or as he is more commonly referred to as the Dude. The story kicks off when Jeff, the Dude Lebowski, is mistaken for a millionaire with the exact same name as him by two thugs who work for a man who the Jeff Lebowski that they are after owes money to. These guys soon figure out that they have the wrong bloke, but before they leave, they, uh, they ruin the dude's rug 
by weighing on it. The dude then sets out to get compensation for the damage done to his rug, and from then on in, a crazy story unfolds. Considering the hit that Fargo had been, The Big Lebowski was considered a box office failure, grossing only $17 million against a $15 million budget. But with the popularity of home media, The Big Lebowski quickly became a success on DVD, and cemented itself as a quintessential film, uh, just one of those movies that you would put on when you didn't know what to watch, in the same vein as like uh, Boogie Nights and uh, Pulp Fiction. Now, if you're a hardcore fan of The Big Lebowski, there is actually an official title for that you would be known as an achiever. And as part of the achievers, you might do something such as go to the annual Lebowski Fest, which started in the United States in 2002. And here's what you can expect. Uh, lots of bowling, live music, and of course, a live screening of the film itself. And what's really great is that actors from the film have supported these festivals in the past. Uh, Julianne Moore, John Turturro, John Goodman, and Jeff Bridges all went in 2011, and I'm Pretty sure that Jeff has been on multiple other occasions as well. Final thing I want to mention is Dudism. Dudism is a religion founded in 2005 and it is dedicated to spreading the lifestyle and wisdom of the dude. It's also sometimes referred to as the Church of the Latter-day Dude. Apparently, there are over 220,000 officially ordained Dudist priests across the globe. And I'm pretty sure that the process for getting ordained is carried out through a website, so something to consider. And quick side note, there's also like this really cool and sought after pinball machine for The Big Lebowski made by Dutch Pinball. Um, just wanted to put that out there. A Clockwork Orange was released in 1971 and is a crime movie directed by the master himself, Stanley Kubrick. And it's set in this dystopian version of Britain. Now, this movie is infamous for its shocking and sometimes graphic content, especially for the time period in which it was released, but it is also equally as revered for its visual flair and uniquely realized world. The film is an adaptation of Anthony Burgess's novel, which was released in 1962, and it follows the main character of Alex, who is a psychopath, he's a delinquent, and he's also the leader of a gang of Drugs. And after committing a series of violent crimes, Alex is eventually caught and sent to a prison where he is subjected to various experimental psychological treatments in an attempt to reform him. Now, upon its release, A Clockwork Orange was super controversial, and that's because it depicts some very violent acts and a lot of, um, and I know it's silly that I'm doing this, but I don't want to trigger the YouTube guidelines, so um, there's a lot of this type of content, and um, like, there's full frontal in this, just straight up. Suffice to say, in the United States, this movie was slapped with an X rating, and then in the United Kingdom, Stanley Kubrick had to pull the movie from release himself due to allegations of copycat violence. Now, despite all of this, or perhaps like even because of all of this, A Clockwork Orange built a cult following, and today it is considered by many to be one of Stanley Kubrick's masterpieces. And many aspects of this film have entered the cinematic and cultural lexicon, like for example, the Corova Milk Bar, Ultra Violence, and then I think the most parodied thing from this film would have to be that one image of Alex with his eyes uh, held open with the wires. And for all of this, we can thank Stanley Kubrick's unapologetic vision. And today, a Clockwork Orange is not only a very important cult film, but it is a touchstone in cinema itself. Blade Runner was released in 1982 and is this science fiction neo-noir detective movie directed by Ridley Scott. And it was the follow-up to his 1979 movie, Alien. And at this point in his career, Ridley was on an absolute tear. Just um, back-to-back -back classics. Blade Runner is largely responsible for pioneering what would become the, um, the cyberpunk aesthetic, which even today is still emulated in our movies, TV shows, and um, of course, video games. The movie presents a bleak and dystopian future, in which a very powerful company known as the Tyrell Corporation bioengineers these synthetic humans known as replicants to go off and work on off-world colonies. The story picks up with Rick Deckard, who is played by the GOAT, Harrison Ford, and he is like this ex-police officer who is also known as a Blade Runner. Deckard is then recruited to hunt down a group of replicants who have gone rogue and uh, decommission them, or, you know, 
kill them. Blade Runner was a box office disappointment as it only grossed $33.8 million against a $28 million budget. And for a plethora of reasons, the film would go on to garner a legendary cult status. And over time, people began to appreciate different aspects of the movie. For example, the depth of its world building, um, the score, the score on the profit, incredible. And then uh, because the movie is just straight up a masterpiece, um, don't read the reviews on Letterboxd. I don't know what's going on there. Since its original theatrical release, the film has been recut several times. And the three main versions are the theatrical version, the director's cut from 1992, and the final cut from 2007. The main difference across these versions is the ending, and they all have different levels of ambiguity when answering the question of whether or not Deckard himself is a replicant, which is something that has been argued and debated about for years and years and years. In 2017, this movie would receive a sequel with Blade Runner 2049, which in its own way also sort of underperformed at the box office, but also it's a banger. We are now in layer two, a little bit more obscure, but there's still some classics here. For example, Donnie Darko. Donnie Darko was released in 2001 and was the directorial debut of writer-director Richard Kelly. The film blends together elements of psychological thrillers and sci-fi and even elements of horror to present this very complex story about time travel and the end of the world. But then at the center of all of that craziness is the story of Donnie, who was an emotionally troubled teenager played by Jake Gyllenhaal in one of his first, I'm not sure if it is his first, but it's definitely one of his first leading roles. This movie also has a, uh, a fantastic one sentence pitch. Let me tell it to you. After narrowly escaping death, when a jet turbine from a 747 falls out of the sky and onto his house, Donnie starts having visions of a giant rabbit named Frank who informs him that the world will end in 28 days incredible stuff. This is one of those movies that always ends up on those most mind like F movies of all time lists. And after you watch it for the first time, you're probably like, what did I just watch? And then you proceed to spend the following hours spiraling into Reddit forums, trying to figure out what just happened in that movie. And then once it does click, you're like, oh, now the timing of the film's release was really unfortunate. And because the key pivotal point in the movie has to do with a plane crash and the September 11 attacks had occurred just a month and a half earlier, the film was scarcely advertised. You layer on top of this, the film's complex narrative about time travel and alternate realities, which confused many audiences. And it's no wonder that the film was a failure at the box office upon its initial theatrical run. And in its theatrical release, the film only grows just over $500,000 against a four and a half million dollar budget. However, after it received a home media release, the film became a runaway hit. DVD sales in the US alone uh, grossed over $10 million. In light of this success, in 2005, a director's cut version of Donnie Darko was released, and this included an extra 20 minutes of footage. Now, my first experience of Donnie Darko when I rented it out as a young lad at the video store was the director's cut, and so I always sort of liked that version and includes a little bit more exposition through the form of title cards, but I am aware that there are a lot of like purists who are sort of against that version. So if you're a fan, let me know below, what is your preferred version of Donnie Darko? And so the film has since garnered a cult following and for a combination of reasons, it's iconic characters and especially the design of Frank, like name a more iconic character design from like 2000s indie films. The complex nature of the film, which encourages discussions and rewatches and Reddit threads upon Reddit threads upon Reddit threads. And then overall, the fact that it's a pretty good movie. Eraserhead was released in 1977 and is the directorial debut of the always intriguing David Lynch. It's a surrealist body horror movie that is uh, quite disturbing and takes us on a journey into the psyche of its protagonist, Harry Spencer. The plot follows Spencer as he navigates an industrial landscape, uh, meets with bizarre characters and grapples with the birth of his deformed child. The film's initial release was limited and due to the fact that it was just so bizarre, 
art and didn't conform to like a typical genre, it was very confounding to audiences and critics alike at the time of its release. Like there were some really scathing reviews at the time, which is very funny to look back on now since the film has had uh, a reappraisal and is considered to be uh, a classic. And due to just how strange and striking the movie was, it was sort of the perfect film to become a midnight movie, which is what we talked about earlier with the Rocky Horror Picture Show. And soon, midnight screenings of A Race Ahead at the Elgin Theatre in New York City began to draw a dedicated following. And this was all spurred on by the film's enigmatic narrative, its haunting sound design, its stark visuals, and that Lynchian thing that people always talk about, that uh, dreamlike quality. People were just absolutely fascinated with this film. One key point of discussion has to do with the fact that the physical effects used to create Spencer's alien-like deformed baby have been kept secret. The prop itself had several working parts. Its neck, eyes, and mouth were all capable of independent operation. And David Lynch, being David Lynch, has been very cryptic when commenting on this prop, stating, quote, it was born nearby, end quote. And, quote, maybe it was found, end quote. The current consensus is that a skinned rabbit may have been involved or um, a lamb of some description. Fun fact, uh, apparently this was one of Stanley Kubrick's favorite movies and during the production for The Shining, he reportedly screened this film to the cast and crew to uh, put them in the mood for the film that he wanted to achieve. The Room was released in 2003 and uh, how does one even begin to articulate such a uh, craftsmanship, such nuance, such mastery of the form. But but seriously, this movie is a big meme, and uh, it is the best meme. Now, according to Wikipedia, The Room is an independent romantic drama film about a melodramatic love triangle between a banker named Johnny, his deceptive fiance, and his conflicted best friend, Mark. Now, that sounds relatively normal, a, a bit like a soap opera, but the reason why the film has become the phenomenon that it has is because uh, that's what the film attempts to be. It tries so hard and so sincerely to be a serious drama, and the fact that it completely fails in almost every possible aspect results in this movie being absolutely hilarious. Now, if you have never seen The Room before, and you also know people who have also never seen The Room before, um, get together and uh, watch it because it will be one of the funniest experiences you can possibly have. And like right there, that's why this movie has a cult following because after you've watched it, you kind of just want everyone to watch it. The film's narrative is disjointed. The dialogue is perplexing. In many ways, it feels like it was written by an alien or an AI. There are several subplots that just uh, literally never resolve. There are abrupt mood changes in the script and characters scene to scene will just have these massive shifts in personality for like no apparent reason. Tommy Wiseau stars as Johnny, but he also directed, wrote, and produced the film, and he is nothing short of an absolute legend. And despite him trying to play it off in interviews, saying that he always intended for the room to be a comedy, it's clear as day that he was 100% earnest in making this film a serious drama. Wiseo solely funded the film's $6 million budget with money that people are still unaware as to where he acquired it. I've heard stories about importing uh, leather jackets and like benefactors, but it's never been made 100% clear. So that just adds to the drama and the mystery of this whole uh, whole thing. Wiseau made numerous poor decisions during the filming that unnecessarily inflated the film's budget, such as building sets for sequences that could have just been filmed on location, purchasing production equipment instead of just renting it, and filming scenes multiple times using different sets. Wiseau rented a studio at the Burns and Sawyer film lot, and he purchased a complete beginning director package, which included two film and HD cameras. Wiseau was confused about the differences between 35 millimeter film and high definition video, but yet he still wanted to be the first director ever to film an entire movie simultaneously on both formats. Only the 35 millimeter film was used in the final cut. And with a staggering budget of $6 million, the room only managed to gross $1,800. However, and this is the case with a lot of these movies, 
DVDs exist. And once people realized that this movie was a big meme, everyone got in on it and it very quickly spread like wildfire. I don't have exact figures, but it is safe to say that since its release, on DVD, this movie has well and truly made its money back. It's become tradition at fan screenings for fans to toss little plastic spoons at the screen. This is in reference to the fact that around Johnny's apartment in the movie, there are framed pictures of spoons for no reason. It, it is completely inexplicable. In 2017, a movie called The Disaster Artist was released, which is about the whole making of the room and Apparently, there's a remake being made of The Room starring Bob Odenkirk, um, and I think that's meant to come out next year, so, um, yeah. Repo Man was released in 1984 and is the debut film by Alex Cox. It combines elements of sci-fi with action with this punk rock aesthetic and is undeniably very 80s. The film follows a punk rocker named Otto who gets a job as a Repo Man and quickly finds himself in the middle of the chaotic world of car repossession in Los Angeles and in particular he finds himself on the quest for a Chevy Malibu. And this particular Chevy Malibu is driven by a lobotomized mad nuclear scientist and in the back of the trunk is an otherworldly cargo which can bring death to those who look into it. And much like the briefcase in Pulp Fiction, and probably in part because the briefcase in Pulp Fiction is inspired by this car trunk, um, the contents of the car trunk remain a mystery throughout the movie. Repo Man eventually grossed $3.7 million against its $1.5 million budget. And while it was considered a success on the scale of which the film was made, it was by no means a, a runaway hit or anything crazy. But in the years since its release, Repo Man has gained a cult following, and today it is in the Criterion Collection. And the box art for that reissue, I'll put it somewhere, um, but it looks really, really cool. And besides being this wacky, campy 1980s film, it's also meant to serve as a commentary and a satire on consumerism. And this can be seen in the decision to make a lot of the packaged products in the movie be in these generic labels that are all in the same uh, color and font. For example, canned food will just be labeled a uh, food and canned soft drink will just be labeled drink. So you don't even get like the, the soft drink on there. It's it's even more generic than that. Today, Repo Man is considered to be a really great and sort of overlooked classic. Nonetheless, it remains a cultural staple and a unique snapshot of 1980s America. Plan 9 from Outer Space is a 1957 science fiction horror film produced, written, directed, and edited by the legendary Ed Wood. Plan 9 script attempts to be an epic, a genre of film that would usually require a very large budget and backing from a major film studio, neither of which Ed Wood had access to. The film's story is about extraterrestrials who are trying to stop humanity from building a doomsday weapon which will eventually destroy the entire universe. To do this, the aliens implement Plan 9, which is a scheme to resurrect the Earth's dead. And um, if you ever played Simpsons Hit and Run, um, I've only just thought of this now, but are you drawing connections? Because because I'm drawing connections here. And by causing all of this chaos, the aliens hope that humanity will listen to them. And if not, they'll just wipe out humanity along with all of the armies of the dead. Now, the film did not have really any success upon its release, and it would play on TV in relative obscurity all the way up until 1980 when Harry and Michael Medved would dub it the worst movie ever made in their very popular book, The Golden Turkey Awards. And they covered a lot of underground, obscure, and very... Uh, uh, bad movies in that book and plan nine came out on top above all of the rest so uh that's saying something and in the same book that dubbed plan nine the worst movie ever made ed wood would also receive an award for the worst movie director of all time and as rough as that sounds this really helped to bolster Ed Wood's legacy as an iconic filmmaker. And after this, the movie would find a cult following and has been described as the epitome of it's so bad, it's good cinema. This would be spurred on by the release of the 1994 Tim Burton directed film, Ed Wood, in which Johnny Depp starred as the eponymous cult filmmaker. And despite winning two Academy Awards, Ed Wood was a financial failure. And 
in its own right is kind of like a cult movie in itself. And if you haven't seen Ed Wood, I do really recommend it. It's a really uh, great film. And I think in recent years, it's starting to get more attention uh, for being a good movie. The Adventure of Buckaroo Banzai Across the Eighth Dimension was a science fiction film released in 1984 and directed by W.D. Richter. It is also simultaneously in the running for the greatest and worst movie title of all time. This may just be one of the most ambitious stories ever put to film, and it is a blend of every conceivable genre, including, but not limited to, westerns, sci-fi, action, martial arts, romance, satire, ugh, kind of, did I say science fiction? Everything you can possibly think of. All in one. Now the story follows Dr. Buckaroo Banzai, who has many claims to fame, including being a neurosurgeon, a physicist, a rock star, and a test pilot, and it is his job to try to save the world from a band of interdimensional aliens known as the Red Electroids. Now, like I said, this movie was a little bit too ambitious for its own good, and the studio didn't really know how to market this film, and what they sort of settled on was avoiding traditional marketing, and instead, they would go to Star Trek conventions where they would show a preview of the movie and give out headbands, which um, are now collector's items. If you have an original Buckaroo Banza headband from a Star Trek convention, um, it's worth a bit of money and it's rare and sought after. Uh, you can't, they're not even online, I couldn't find any. And it didn't help that this movie was released alongside two of the biggest hits from the 1980s, that being Ghostbusters and Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. And so Buckaroo Banzai was a box office bomb, managing to gross only $6.3 million against its $17 million budget. But the movie was just way too unique to stay forgotten. And so over the years, it has grown this cult following who really appreciate the movie's unorthodox orthodox storytelling. And John Lithgow, who plays the bad guy in this movie, has often said that this is one of his favorite roles that he's ever played. At the end credits of the movie, there is a title that is teased that says Buckaroo Banzai Against the World Crime League. And this was intended to be a teaser for the upcoming planned sequel that never came to fruition because, um, well, this movie bombed at the box office. And the movie wouldn't get a sequel until 2021. And that came in the form of a novel. And while it's not a movie, it was pretty well received by the fan base from what I read. But regardless, Buckaroo Banzai will live on as a cult classic and a staple of 1980s eccentricity. Released in 1970, El Topo is a Mexican acid western film written, directed, scored by, and starring the legendary Alejandro Jodorowsky. While in many aspects it is a western, it also features very bizarre characters and heavy doses of Judeo-Christian symbolism and Eastern philosophy. So El Topo basically took the western genre and just flipped it on its head and then imbued it with a ton of like religious symbolism. Now the main character of the film is a gunfighter known as El Topo. El Topo is played by Jodorowsky himself. We follow him on his quest for enlightenment through the desert as he meets with different spiritual leaders and is faced with different challenges along the way. Along with being just super out there and very art house, El Topo is also very graphic in its depictions of violence and certain things that once again I'm trying not to say on here because uh, I want to stay monetized. And if you do watch the film, one of the things that really stands out is the sound design and just how unconventional and like abrasive it is. Sounds such as screaming will be turned up very loud in the mix. And this results in a very unnerving and sort of anxiety inducing experience. And we talked about a few of the midnight movies earlier, Rocky Horror Picture Show, Eraserhead and Pink Flamingos. But El Topo was actually the first of the midnight movie successes. After it started getting screened at mid night at the Elgin Theatre in New York, it soon found a dedicated audience. It got to the point where the movie was attracting the attention of some really notable figures, in particular George Harrison and John Lennon from The Beatles, and this would be very important as John Lennon liked this movie so much that he would play a key role in funding Jodorowsky's next film, The Holy Mountain. And with that, we transition. The Holy Mountain was the follow-up film to El Topo, and it was once again written, directed, produced, 
co-scored and co-edited by Alejandro Jodorowsky. It was released in 1973 following the success of El Topo on the midnight movie circuit, which would eventually gain the attention of John Lennon and George Harrison, like I mentioned uh, two seconds ago. This helped Jodorowsky attain funding as the Beatles manager Alan Klein helped to produce and John Lennon and Yoko Ono contributed production money. The little story that there is follows a group of people who are in a quest for enlightenment, and so they end up giving up their possessions to follow a spiritual leader who is played by Jodorowsky. So once again, common themes between this and El Topo. And being a Jodorowsky film, it feels like every aspect of the frame is deliberate, much like a Kubrick film or a Wes Anderson film. Upon release, The Holy Mountain garnered immediate attention for its vivid and often shocking imagery and its abstract non-linear storyline that was filled with symbolism and tarot references. And then you have the wholly unique and rule-breaking ending of the film, which helped to spur on the discussion. Critics and audiences were polarized. Today, in the body of Jodorowsky's work, this film is generally considered to be his magnum opus, a cinematic masterpiece that has gone on to inspire generations of filmmakers. And especially in the last decade, with Jodorowsky's movies becoming way more accessible due to streaming, there has been an increased level of discussion around his work and, in particular, The Holy Mountain. Pink Flamingos was released in 1972 and was directed by John Waters, who is probably better known for directing movies like Hairspray and Crybaby, starring Johnny Depp. But if you wind it back to the start of his career, he was making some really uh, strange films. The film stars Divine, who in the 1970s was a very popular countercultural drag queen and in large part due to these films. In the film Divine, playing a character known as Babs Johnson, he is competing for the title of the filthiest person alive. And that was apparently the whole ethos going into making this film. In interviews, John Waters has said that his goal with Pink Flamingos was to make quote, the trashiest motion picture ever. Armed with a $10,000 budget from his parents, John Waters set out to make a movie that pushed the envelope in every possible way. The film features a long list of things that I don't want to be too specific about because YouTube guidelines, but broadly speaking, um, things that you would have expected to see in an X-rated picture from that era, acts of violence, and probably what would be most shocking today is a scene involving a chicken being uh, very poorly mistreated. And that's how I'm going to put it. The final scene of the film is probably the most uh, iconic and, and discussed scene of the whole thing. And that involves Divine consuming steaming fresh dog poo. And um, this all happens in one take, so you know it's real. And because of that, apparently this scene took like hours to film with the crew and Divine following this dog around the streets, waiting for it to poo. Pink Flamingos premiered at Baltimore University and it sold out three consecutive screenings as it was drawing a lot of interest from underground cinema enthusiasts. And it wouldn't take long for the people over at the Elgin Theatre in New York, which we talked about earlier when we were talking about Eraserhead and we were talking about the Rocky Horror Picture Show, it wouldn't take long for them to get their hands on Pink Flamingos and very quickly it became a staple of the midnight movie circuit. Similar to Rocky Horror, it became tradition for fans to recite lines during the film. However, the film faced bans abroad, notably in Switzerland, Australia, uh, parts of Canada, and Norway. And when it was eventually released on VHS tape here in Australia in 1984, it got slapped with an X rating, and then it was subsequently discontinued at some point between then and now. I'm not quite sure when. And despite all of this, the legacy of Pink Flamingos persists. And in 2022, the Criterion Collection, the Criterion Collection, released a 4K restoration of Pink Flamingos, which I'm not sure if I should be surprised by, um, but I am. Windy City Heat was released in 2003 and was directed by Bobcat Goldthwait for Comedy Central. And my history with this movie is 
When I first found out about it a few years ago, I downloaded the only good quality version of it that I could find because it is very hard to get your hands on. And I ended up putting it onto a USB that lives in my work backpack. So for the past few years, uh, Windy City Heat has kind of been following me around wherever I go. The movie is shot like a mockumentary and it follows Perry Caravello, who is an aspiring actor who is tricked into believing that he will be starring in an upcoming crime movie called Windy City Heat. And everybody else in his life and I mean quite literally everybody else, is in on the joke that the movie is just one highly elaborate prank on Perry. And it isn't a work of fiction, like this is actually a real prank happening to a real person. Each scene in the fictional Windy City Heap presents Perry with increasingly absurd and strange challenges that are designed to test the limits of just how far he will go to be a great actor. And despite just how deranged some of these challenges are, Perry approaches each and every single one of them with this broken kind of logic and level of sincerity, and he goes along with all of them. And that's what makes the movie so captivating, is Perry Caravello himself. He lacks a level of self-awareness, and that in tandem with his huge ego and um, unsavory opinions, results in some really, really wild interactions. And even to this day, Perry doesn't seem to fully grasp what Windy City Heat was. In 2010, some of the side characters from the film started a podcast called The Big Three. And on there, they go into more detail about their experiences making the movie and uh, Perry himself. The movie has become a cult classic and it's still relatively underground because it is so hard to get your hands on a good copy of the film, but nonetheless, there is a passionate fan base. And some of us keep it on uh, USBs in our work backpack. So um, yeah. Manos, The Hands of Fate was released in 1966 and was written, directed, and produced by Harold P. Warren. Now the last few films that we talked about, while somewhat obscure, are still pretty well regarded and uh, revered in, in certain ways, but um, not this one. Manos, The Hands of Fate is often referred to as the worst movie ever made. And for many, many years, it held the very prestigious title of being the lowest rated movie on IMDb. And even though there's a pretty strong case for this being uh, the worst movie ever made, I would wager that there is actually a movie lower down in this iceberg that gives it a pretty good run for its money. But we'll get to that afterwards. The film follows this family who gets stranded in the Texas desert while they are on a road trip, and they find themselves at the residence of a polygamous pagan cult led by a man known as the Master. Now, before making this film, Harold P. Warren had no experience in filmmaking, and by trade, he was a fertilizer and insurance salesman. However, he was very active in the theater scene in El Paso, and that's where he would meet the screenwriter, Sterling Silifin. Then one day while chatting with Silifin in a coffee shop, Warren said something along the lines of, uh, you know, it isn't that hard to make a movie. And you know what? I bet I could make a movie all by myself. And so, he bet Silifant that he could make a movie all by himself, despite having no prior experience. And Warren must have been selling uh, lots of fertilizer because he managed to finance the entire $19,000 budget by himself. And when we account for inflation, that works out to be about $170,000 today. He scouted his actors from a local theater and modeling agency. And much like Warren, they too had no prior experience working in film. And instead of paying wages, Warren promised the cast and crew a cut of the profits from the movie. The result of all of this was a film film that was plagued by a plethora of deficiencies, affecting even the most basic stuff like continuity and editing, audio syncing, um, the acting of course, and several disconnected and inexplicable scenes. Suffice to say, Manos was not a success upon its release, and it remained in relative obscurity all the way up until the early 90s when it was featured in an episode of the Mystery Science Theatre 3000, which was a TV show based around making fun of B-movies. And it was after this that it developed a cult reputation for being one of the worst movies ever made. And then in 2011, the original 16mm work print, which had been missing for decades, was discovered. And that means that if you want to buy it, there is a remastered Blu-ray of this movie. Or you could settle for the like 240p version on YouTube, uh, up to you.
Liquid Sky was released in 1982 and is an independent science fiction film directed by Slava Sukerman. The movie had a budget of $500,000 and it was part of this film movement known as the No Wave movement that was very prominent in New York during the mid 1980s. Sukerman was originally a Russian documentarian, but upon arriving in New York, he found himself inspired by the authenticity of the No Wave movement. And so he set out to capture just that with Liquid Sky. After moving to New York with the dream of being becoming a fashion model, Margaret, who is an androgynous and bisexual woman, finds herself being taken advantage of and mistreated by the people around her. And this is where it goes off the rails, because in the world of Liquid Sky, there are aliens uh, that love heroin. Now, they don't find any heroin, but what they do find out is that the chemicals released in the brain during an orgasm are even better. And so they begin to follow Margaret around and they absorb the orgasm chemicals from all of the people that Margaret sleeps with. As a result of absorbing these chemicals, they actually end up killing anybody that Margaret sleeps with. All of this is happening unbeknownst to her. Now, Margaret's not exactly sure why this is happening or what's causing it, but she does realize that she kind of has this strange power. And so she decides to use it to take revenge on all of the awful people in her life. Now, at the time of its release, Liquid Sky was actually pretty successful for for an independent film, grossing $1.7 million against its $500,000 budget. The film would go on to have a profound influence on what was known as the Electro Clash aesthetic, which was very prominent in the club scene in the early 2000s. And with its wholly original story, distinctive visuals, production design, and soundtrack, it's no wonder that Liquid Sky has become a cult classic. Haxen was released in 1922 and is a Swedish-Danish silent horror film written and directed by Benjamin Christensen. The movie was largely inspired by the Malaeus Maleficarum, which is an infamous anti-witchcraft treatise that was written in the 15th century for German inquisitors. Christensen's commentary is layered over these very visually striking reenactments that go from the Middle Ages all the way through to the early modern period, in which we see things like witch hunts and different occult practices. The takeaway that the movie eventually lands on is that witch hunts were most likely the result of people misunderstanding mental illness with a healthy dose of mass hysteria thrown in there. And um, yeah, it sounds about right. The highly detailed recreation of the medieval scenes in combination with the sheer length of the production resulted in Haxon being the most expensive Scandinavian silent film ever made at the time. And honestly, it kind of paid off because these effects hold up surprisingly well, and in many ways, they are much more effective and unnerving than anything that CGI could capture. I'm sure I've got images somewhere, but um, yeah, freaky stuff. Given the era that the movie was released in, it was unusually graphic. And even though it had a great reception in its home country, the censors in Germany, France, and the United States were like, it wasn't released in the United States until 1968, and that was only after it had been re-edited. Over the years, Haxon has gained a reputation as a cult classic due to its artistry, its unique style, and for being one of the earliest examples of a horror movie. Gummo is an experimental drama film that was released in 1997 and was the directorial debut of a then 23-year-old Harmony Kareen. And uh, that's super young to make a movie. I often think about PTA um, when he made Magnolia. He was 27 when he did this. Uh, when he did Boogie Nights, he was 25, which is crazy. But yeah, Harmony Kareen, 23 when he directed this, which is like, he's the same age as me when he did this. Off the back of the surprise success of Kids, which was an independent movie that Harmony Kareen had written, but not directed, he was put in touch with Kerry Woods, who budgeted $1 million for whatever his next project would be. And that eventually ended up being Gummo. The movie is based in an Ohio town which had been devastated by a tornado two decades earlier in the 1970s. Now the movie takes traditional plot and story and it's just like, Phew. instead it's very fragmented and it's non-linear and it mainly ends up being these vignettes of characters going about their day-to-day -day lives in this town. And they usually end up doing things that are either destructive uh, and or disturbing. Now I'm not gonna be too specific, but the movie features things like uh, cats, much to the dismay of the cats because of what happens to the cats in the movie. Um, if you like cats, baby, don't watch this. Satanic rituals, people getting taken advantage of, uh, disgusting bathtubs, bacon taped 
to walls that doesn't require further elaboration um and yeah just a whole plethora of other things now when casting this film kareem went out of his way to use non-actors and so he chose people not by how they read the lines but because of the visual aura that they put off and the net result of this is a film with almost entirely non-actors who are local to the town other notable things about the movie is the dreamlike sort of ethereal quality that it brings which is helped in part by the absolutely eclectic soundtrack which features death metal madonna buddy holly and uh roy orbison so it's all there i don't know if i made this clear earlier but this film is pretty disturbing and received negative reactions from critics upon its release and was a really hard sell for audiences this meant that the movie only ended up grossing one hundred thousand dollars against its 1.3 million dollar budget over the years, however, Gummo grew a cult audience and even garnered the support of some notable filmmakers such as Werner Herzog and Gus Van Sant. And even though this movie has one of the absolute lowest Metacritic ratings I've ever seen, it has a 3.6 on Letterboxd. So the critical reappraisal is upon us, apparently. Carnival of Souls was released in 1962 and is a black and white psychological horror film directed by Herc Harvey. One of the video essays that I watched on this movie likened the vibe of it to like a full length episode of The Twilight Zone. The plot follows Mary who, after surviving a car accident, moves far away to get a new job as an organist at a new church. But along the way, she starts to be haunted by visions of this ghoulish looking man in a suit. And um, he will just like appear and it's quite frightening and once mary settles into this new town uh which is in utah i don't know if that's an important detail but it's in utah um she becomes obsessed with this abandoned carnival which is on like this boardwalk and it's there that her visions start to intensify and she starts to see more of these figures which we can refer to as uh souls and hence carnival of souls the title of the movie the film was shot on a budget of thirty-three thousand dollars, which if we adjust for inflation works out to about three hundred and thirty thousand dollars today and despite the low budget harvey was able to achieve some pretty remarkable and striking visuals uh, akin to that of Ingmar Bergman. Unfortunately, at the time, Carnival of Souls went largely unnoticed by audiences and critics, and it wouldn't be until several art house screenings in the late 1980s that the film started to achieve this sort of cult reputation. And once the film picked up a bit of steam, it soon became a critical darling, and people started saying like, oh, this is a, this is a very important movie. And luckily, Harvey was still alive to see his film get the appreciation and respect that it deserved. Today, the movie is considered a low budget horror classic. And in 2016, it entered the Criterion Collection with a Blu-ray and new restoration. And as is the case with a lot of the Criterion Collection, I think the uh, the cover art's pretty sweet, um, but yeah. Freaks was released in 1932 and is a drama film with like horror elements and it was directed by Todd Browning who is known for directing the original classic Dracula film that starred Bela Lugosi as Dracula. Now Freaks was released two years prior to the introduction of what was known as the Haynes Code which is when Hollywood really started to crack down on what you could and couldn't put in movies. And the censorship in the postcode era was uh, extremely strict. Freaks is set in the circus and in the world of sideshow performers and freak shows. And it follows a trapeze artist known as Cleopatra, who ends up marrying a little person from the circus known as Hans. But she doesn't marry him because she loves him. She marries him because she's a gold digger. Turns out Hans has a pretty sweet inheritance and uh, she wants to get her hands on it. But once Hans and the other performers find out about this, um, that's when this becomes a horror movie. <laughs> and one of the reasons why the movie was just so shocking to audiences at the time was because the performers are real and their conditions are real. It's not the result of makeup or special effects. Now I'm not going to be able to mention all of the performers, but some of the notable ones were Jack Eck as Half Boy, Prince Randian as The Living Torso, Schlitzy, Ogla Roderick as the bearded lady, and Frances O'Connor as the armless girl. And as I alluded to earlier, the reason why the movie generally gets slapped with that horror movie label is because the sideshow performers mutilate Cleopatra. That being said, the test screenings for the movie were disastrous, and it prompted the studio to cut 30 minutes from the movie, which 
has since been lost to time. And following this, the movie was still a box office failure. At some point in the 1960s, there were conversations happening around this film, and it ended up being screened at the Venice Film Festival in 1962. And since, the film has gained a cult following, with critics asserting that the film was pretty far ahead of its time in the way that it portrayed people with disabilities, and that the portrait that it paints is a largely sympathetic one. Begotten was released in 1989 and is an experimental horror film written, directed, and produced by Elias Marriage. Think about Hexen, the movie we discussed earlier, which I do realize now I mispronounced for the entire segment of that video. Think that, but way more gritty and way more graphic. And on top of that, the movie is largely plotless. It serves mainly as a vehicle for symbolism and graphic imagery relating to creation myths from Christianity, Celtic mythology, and Slavic paganism. But the basic story would be that the movie follows two characters, the mother of Earth and the son of Earth, who set out across a landscape and at the end of the movie meet a very gruesome end. Now the movie opens on a shot of this lovely gentleman here, who is sitting in a chair and convulsing violently. We later on find out that this gentleman is a representation of God, who proceeds to, in the chair, disembowel himself with a razor blade. And through this death, he gives birth to the mother of Earth and the son of Earth who we discussed earlier. And although it was largely ignored by mainstream critics at the time, it would go on to influence several avant-garde uh, visual artists, filmmakers, and musicians. And off the back of the success of Begotten, Marriage would go on to direct music videos for Marilyn Manson, as well as other feature-length films. The most notable one being The Shadow of the Vampire, which stars John Malkovich and Willem Dafoe. And it's really interesting too, because Shadow of a Vampire tells the true story about the making of the classic 1922 silent horror film Nosferatu. And if you watch Spongebob, you know what I'm talking about. And in that film, there are recreations of the original 1922 silent film, and they are damn near flawless, like absolutely accurate. After Last Season is a 2009 science fiction film that was produced, written, and directed by Mark Regan. And after reading some stuff online, I'm not even sure if that is his real name. That may be a pseudonym. But nonetheless, it is the product of one man, which usually means that it's gonna be off the Richter scale. Now, before I said that there may be a movie that is worse than Manos, The Hands of Fate. This is what I was talking about. Now the plot summary of the movie that I found goes like this. There are two medical students, uh, Matthew and Sarah, who employ the use of experimental microchips in their brain in an attempt to uncover the identity of a serial killer who has been murdering their classmates. And the way that these microchips work is that it allows them to visualize the future which in the movie is rendered using CGI. And there is just no description that I could provide that can adequately convey just how confounding and how awful these renders are. And the fact that large, significant portions of the movie look like that. Now the movie was shot using 35 millimeter film and still manages to look Bad. The film was shot over the course of five or six days in an empty house and all of the medical equipment is fake. It's made from cardboard, but it's attempting to look realistic. And here's the thing that is like, just so confusing to me. Uh, even basic stuff like furniture, where they could have just used the furniture, it's also made out of cardboard. Like, why? But now I'm going to drop the bombshell. The budget for this movie was reportedly five million dollars. Here are some other movies that also cost five million dollars to make. Now apparently the five million dollars was spent on the CGI sequences that we talked about earlier, but surely that's impossible. And so this has led people to speculate whether or not this movie might just be a big embezzlement scam. But that being said, Mark Regan, or whatever his real name is, seems to like have taken this movie very seriously because after it released, he review bombed IMDb with fake user accounts, leaving 10 star reviews. This movie is so poorly made that it makes the room look like a masterpiece. It's past that point of so bad it's good that it's just bad.
The Beaver Trilogy was released in 2001 and is a part fiction, part documentary movie, uh, I'll explain that in a second, but it is just a collection of three shorter films that were recorded at different times. So the first was in 1979, the second in 1981, and the third in 1984. And they were all done by the same filmmaker, Trent Harris. Now Trent Harris has a reputation for being a pretty revered underground filmmaker and he's made several other movies that very well could have been on this iceberg such as Reuben and Ed and uh, Plan 10 from Outer Space but his most notable work is the Beaver Trilogy. Now this movie isn't about beavers uh, that's just in reference to Beaver which is the town in which it is set. Now first of all there's no official way to stream the Beaver Trilogy online. I mean there's a few shorter clips on YouTube but without the broader context it really doesn't make any sense. The only official way to watch it is to buy a DVD of it through Trent Harris's website, which I wanna take a moment to highlight. The design here is like a perfect assimilation of every archaic cliche of late 90s web design. And now is the perfect time for me to let you know about today's sponsor. No, I, I don't have a sponsor, but now what really helped me out when researching this was a documentary with a very confusing title, uh, The Beaver Trilogy 4, and it was narrated by Bill Hader, so that was uh, very cool. So the original film that was shot in 1979 is titled The Beaver Kid. So basically Trent Harris was in the parking lot one day testing out a new video camera for the new station that he worked at when he randomly met this other guy who was in the parking lot he was just going around taking photos of things like the news helicopter and whatnot. And almost as if it was fate, these two start talking to each other and Harris captures this whole interaction on the new video camera. The guy's name is Dick Griffiths and he is 21 years old and in the movie he's titled as Groove and Gary. Griffiths starts doing impersonations like John Wayne and he expresses to Harris that he is really excited to quote, be on the tube and that he's always wanted to be in show business and maybe this exchange on camera, this could be his big break. And Harris realizes that there's something about this Griffiths fella. He has like this infectious magnetic personality and so they keep talking. Before Griffiths leaves, we get a look at his car. And on his car windows, there are like tributes to Olivia Newton-John. Anyways, he drives away. Fast forward a little bit and Griffiths and Harris have kept in touch. And Griffiths tells Harris to come to Beaver where he lives and that He'll be putting on a talent show and he'll do an impersonation of Olivia Newton-John and that it would make for great film. You should come and we should, we should record this thing. Harris eventually decides to do it and so he makes the trip to Beaver to film this talent show. Now we get a scene of Griffiths getting his makeup put on uh, by the local mortician. Um, that's just one of the uh, great details about this thing. And the reason he's getting his makeup put on is because he's going to be performing in full Olivia Newton-John drag because he goes all the way with these things. And then we get to see Griffiths performing Please Don't Keep Me Waiting by Olivia Newton-John in drag, and the movie ends, and that is the entire uh, first movie. Hi, I don't know how jarring the cut will be, uh, but I'm just gonna pick up where I left off last night because I didn't finish recording this section of the video. Now, after this first film, Harris and Griffiths cease to have any more contact, but for some reason, Harris is still sort of obsessed with the whole experience, the drag performance, the meeting in the parking lot, and everything that happened in between. And so that takes us into the second movie, which is titled The Beaver Kid 2. Now these next two films, and this is gonna sound kind of strange, but they aren't documentaries, but instead fictional retellings of that first documentary. And they include all the key scenes, like that initial meeting, the uh, getting ready and drag, and of course, the final Olivia Newton-John performance. Now, another really odd detail, which just contributes to the whole legend of this thing, is that Harris somehow miraculously cast two future movie stars in the role of Groove and Gary before they were even famous. For 1981's The Beaver Kid 2, which was shot on a home video camera in black and white and with a budget of $100, Harris cast two-time Oscar winner, Sean Penn. And it is just a beat for beat recreation of that first documentary, but with Sean Penn. There are a few other scenes as well, uh, but we'll get to that in a second. I just realized my lights went on. Huh? Then in 1984, Harris decides that he wants to recreate the whole thing all over again, but this time he changes the town, calls it the Orkley Kid, has a budget of $50,000, and in the role of Groove and Gary, he casts Crispin Glover, 
just one year prior to his rise to fame for playing George McFly in Back to the Future. Now, let me tell you about those extra scenes that Harris added in, in the subsequent recreations, and especially in the Orkley Kid, where he goes into a lot more detail. There is a scene set late at night in which Griffiths calls Harris on the telephone and expresses that he wasn't completely comfortable with his performance and, and being on film and in drag and all of these things. And he expresses like, maybe we don't release the movie. And then the fictionalized version of Harris, who is played by an actor, so like it's super meta, says like, mate, I've worked really hard on this. Don't worry, the movie will be fine. After the phone call, the fictionalized character of Griffiths takes a shotgun and puts it into his mouth uh, and comes about this close to pulling the trigger before deciding not to. And this raises a lot of questions. Why were these scenes added? Are they based on any form of reality? And if so, is this like an admission of guilt? And when presented with these questions in subsequent interviews, Harris has just shut them down and said like, look, it's just a work of fiction. In the documentary that I watched on this, we learned that after the making of that original 1979 film, Griffiths fell into a really dark place and he got to the point where he did make an attempt on his life. And his family members discussed that Griffiths was never quite the same after it. It was in 2001 when Trent Harris was re-releasing a lot of his older movies when he realized that when you put all three of these films together and watch them back to back, it makes for a really interesting character study. He ended up titling it The Beaver Trilogy. And at the film's premiere, the audience made a very strong connection with it. And soon enough, Harris was invited to screen The Beaver Trilogy at the Sundance Film Festival, which is a huge, huge deal. And after all of these decades with absolutely no contact, Harris decided to try to reach out to Dick Griffiths, the original Beaver Kid, the original Groove and Gary, and set aside tickets for him for this premiere, but there was no response. And so the movie screened and it went down really well with the Sundance audience. And then after the Q and A through the crowd of people, a face emerged and he went up to Harris and he said, you probably won't remember me, but Harris immediately knew who it was. It was Dick Griffiths, the beaver kid, the original Groove and Gary. And as soon as word got out that the beaver kid was at Sundance, every photographer, celebrity, everybody at Sundance in that room wanted to meet the Beaver Kid. And he finally got his moment, what he had always dreamed of. And after this, Harris and Griffiths would keep in touch. And they even started to discuss the idea of making a Beaver Kid part four. And Griffiths started sending Harris voice memos and, and ideas and music. And it was just like really wholesome. But before any of that could come to fruition, in 2009, Dick Griffiths tragically passed away from a heart attack at age 50. And I'll tell you what, I near cried uh, at the end of the documentary. And I I wasn't expecting to be sent down an emotional rabbit hole by this iceberg. But yeah, that is the Beaver Trilogy. I hope it made sense. And with that collection of films, the legacy of Dick Griffiths will live on forever. Yeah, send me down the rabbit hole. Reflections of Evil was released in 2002 and is the very singular vision of one man, Damon Packard, who wrote, produced, directed, and stars in this movie. The IMDb synopsis for this is wild, and it goes roughly like this. Julie, who died from a PCP overdose as a teenager in the 1970s, searches from beyond the ethers to make contact with her little brother, Bob, who was an obese watch salesman dying from sucrose intolerance in the 1990s. And as crazy as that sounds, it really doesn't do justice to the experience of actually watching this movie. You could fast forward to any point in this movie and it seems like there are decisions being made either in regards to acting, dialogue, sound design, or just literally what is on screen that have been made to make the audience feel as uneasy as possible. For example, a character walks across a room, but with every step they take, their shoes make very loud cartoon-like squeaking noises. And there is a lot of ADR in this movie. So an inconsequential character might say something, but they will either have A, the voice of a literal demon, or B, they sound like a, a high-pitched cartoon character, or a character is walking down the street when he gets jumped by people with nunchucks. Or there is a scene between uh, two characters talking, but in the window in the background, there's a Sasquatch. This movie was clearly a passion project for Packard as he funded the entire movie himself, uh, apparently using an inheritance that he received. The movie didn't receive a traditional release, but instead Packard printed uh, somewhere along the lines of 23,000 DVDs, which he would then give away for free. And in an attempt to drum up publicity for the movie, he would mail these DVDs to celebrities hoping to get their reactions. I'm not sure how successful this was. And if you do a quick Google search, I think I came across Damon Packard's YouTube channel, which is still very active today. A lot of very surreal AI content 
gets posted on there, which focuses on like certain filmmakers. It's hard to explain, but if you, you'll be able to look it up. And so that is Reflections of Evil. And while it might not be like the Godfather part two, in terms of very unique, very obscure and strange underground movies, this ticks all of the boxes. And this got me thinking, like there must be at least 10 other people out there like Damon Packard who did this similar thing where they funded their own movies. And I'm sure that some of these would be super obscure. Like you couldn't even find information about them online. So what I'm kind of saying is that I think there is a whole other deeper layer to this iceberg and um, it would probably make a really great video. So if you have any suggestions or something along those lines, leave it in the comments below. Now I didn't get around to the American astronaut or under the silver lake, which I adore, but I'm thinking like they might even warrant their own video down the track. And so that is the entire uh, cult movie iceberg. I just wanna say thank you so much for the support uh, I've received so far, especially on the F1 iceberg. Before I posted that video, this channel had 85 subscribers. And as I'm recording this now, it has 1,000 and 53 subscribers. Uh, the channel is now monetized, which I haven't quite processed yet. I really appreciate this opportunity and I don't plan on stopping anytime soon. I want to keep making these videos. So yeah, thank you so much for watching and I will catch you in the next one.